everyone to Give God 90 Radio On Demand. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining me for just a little while for such an important topic that we have to discuss today. Uh, First, though, I want to say thank you to all the new folks. If you're new to Give God 90 and you haven't done so yet, you you can join the ever-growing amount of people who download the Give God 90 app and uh, take control of these podcasts by you know being notified you can go back and you can uh you can actually listen to the archives you can download them you can do all kinds of things uh you actually can choose when you're notified when these podcasts are released or when they're live all that good stuff just by taking less than a minute to download an absolutely free app uh, for your convenience, and it's for your Apple Android device, doesn't matter, it's all there, it's available for you, and I uh, hope you do so. There's a lot of people that use that and really enjoy it, really like it. Uh, <clears throat> the The topic today, I was actually going to address this with uh, Myra that we when, when we do the live podcast and the live uh, Facebook feed on uh, Thursdays, but I decided once I got into it, I needed to spend more time with this and go into a little more detail, a little more depth, because it is so important. And I'd like to have a little more leeway uh, on the live things to keep it a little lighter. This is, this is, I'm going to be honest with you, this is kind of a heavy topic, okay? This is, this is not fun to talk about. But we need to really have this discussion in in the United States today, <clears throat> excuse me, and possibly worldwide, because you know we have such a drastic uh, change in the culture. Let's let's put it that way, where some things are being more accepted today as normal, and uh, that's just not a good thing. All right. <clears throat> When we think about uh, suicide, we often want to separate that, okay, from uh, what many people would consider an accidental drug overdose. What happens if we say, you know what, the same thing possibly that drives people to take their own life may be very closely associated to the same thing that causes someone to take so many drugs in an attempt to escape society or escape the whatever situation they're in. Those things may be so closely related that we should probably treat them the same. I said this was an important topic, and here's where we're going with this. If we look at suicide in the Bible... You know, we see uh, seven places where it's mentioned, okay? Seven people in Scripture uh, took their own life. Uh, and actually, I, I actually had forgotten about the first one, okay? But uh, Abimelech was mortally wounded. Um, <laughs> and he ordered his armor bearer to kill him. So... Uh, he, he wanted to avoid the, the, any uh, any misconception that a woman uh, had killed him. Okay? And you find that in Judges chapter 9. And then we see, uh, oh, here is a fun name to pronounce. Ahitopel. He hanged himself. Now, when I say he hanged himself, don't think that he took a piece of rope and threw it over a tree branch, okay? When they look in the uh, Old Testament, when you hung yourself, okay, it was done. You would put your sword uh, down on the ground in such a way, and then you would impale yourself on it. But he had betrayed David, and you find that in in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 17. Zimri burned his house down around him. Uh, he had suffered a drastic military defeat that is found in First Kings sixteen. Um, Saul, of course, you know, fell on his sword along with his armor bearer, that is found in First Samuel and also First uh, Chronicles chapter ten. Samson 
We often don't think of you know Samson and Delilah, but Samson brought the house down on top of himself. He actually committed suicide when he did that by bringing the house down. And then, of course, we see Judas again. Uh, you know, a disciple of Yeshua Jesus, and he and he <clears throat> hanged himself the same way that Saul did, the same way that um, um, the and uh, the, the fellow in Second Samuel, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, and that is a name that is is tough, no matter what language you speak. But there are the the seven places in the Bible where people commit suicide. Now, a lot of times, the Bi- people want to say, "Well, the Bible speaks out against suicide," but it doesn't speak out against it here. It simply says it happened. But here's the thing: these people chose death. All right, these seven people in the Bible chose to die. Now, they didn't do so, they, they weren't depressed, they didn't have any anxiety, we don't read about any addiction, okay? A lot of the reasons that people often choose death today, they choose to take their own life today, is not part of what these people did. <clears throat> the suicides we read about in these passages, but we, we learn an important lesson from them. Um, some may consider these an act of disgrace, and... You know, that is not necessarily what they're doing here. <clears throat> what each is the result of is an act of dishonor. Okay? Uh, of course, Abimelech, or I'm sorry, Abimelech uh, was, was mortally wounded. He was going to die anyway. Uh, he knew he had been dishonored, and he told his armor bearer to take his life. Okay? That isn't an act of depression that really isn't an act of defiance that is an act of uh of dishonor quite honestly and and each of those <clears throat> right through uh Judas taking his own life he had dishonored the very person that he had vowed to honor so that a lot of times is different okay because that culture was different. We, they looked at it differently than we do today because it's a completely different culture. Uh, you know, these things run from about uh, 38, 36, 3800 years ago all the way through uh, 2,000 years ago. Completely different culture. And we don't really grasp and have a firm understanding of the whole uh, death before dishonor thing today, Right. You know, we say it, sometimes it, it's becoming less and less of a, uh, I don't want to say a, a, a policy among certain individuals, but it, it certainly is uh, not looked at the way it was many, many years ago. <clears throat> now, I am not here to say that it is acceptable, okay, but we're going to look at with this is why we are in this problem today. Okay, we're going to look at something, and as it comes out, I hope you understand that these people are choosing death today in in today's society, especially in the United States. All right. We have what I would consider a dramatically high rate of suicide uh, just from our military ranks. The people who had, had served and served honorably, they come home and something causes them um, some type of, of discomfort. Let's, let's start there, all right? Let's just call it discomfort. At first, part of the issue with some of the military folks that come home that I have talked to and and that I have uh, had people relay to me really come from this idea or this concept that they would go serve. When they came home, everything would be exactly the way it was when they left. And it's never, ever that way. It's impossible for it to be that way. It can't be that way. But they, when they leave, they're under this uh, oh, fantasy, for lack of a better word, 
that when they return, they're going to just pick up where they left off. You can't do that. Okay, you can't walk out the door, turn around and come back in two seconds later without something changing. It's just that simple. That's just the way life is. <clears throat> but today, you know, we have all of these things going on. And I honestly believe, I honestly believe that we should place overdose in that category of attempted suicide. Because many times, especially uh, when we look at some statistics, people are using all kinds of ways to take their own life. It's not just with you know, a knife or a gun or a razor blade or a rope or we're stepping off a bridge. You know, there's lots of ways to do it. it you, somebody, I can't remember who, who said this, but somebody is quoted as saying, you're dying is easy, it's the living that's the hard part. It's true. And if we think about, if we think about these overdoses as a type of attempted suicide, because they are, you know, when you're using drugs, you are attempting to escape a certain amount of reality. And the farther from reality people travel, sometimes the better they like it. And it's sad but it's true. And, and here's where things get a little complicated. I have looked and I cannot find any studies uh, that have statistics comparing uh, post-counseling suicide as people who commit suicide after counseling or people who overdose after counseling or rehabilitation. Okay, there's no statistics uh, that actually compare if they received counseling from a secular uh, organization or a secular type person, a doctor, there's nothing to compare that to the people who receive counseling from uh, pastors or church staff. And, and what I was looking for was are the people who uh, receive counseling from a secular type group, whether it's an individual counselor, psychologist, medical doctor, you know, do they have a higher rate than the people who receive counseling from a pastor or a church group? Now, that seems might seem kind of odd for some people to say, well, why would you look for those statistics? And what I was looking for was something specific. But because those statistics, I can't find those statistics, they may exist. If they do, please send me a message and let me know where I can find that. So it leads me to speculate a little bit here, okay? So here's my speculation warning. I'm going to say that these rates are approximately the same, and they're the same for one major reason. Whether you are a counselor, an individual counselor, or counseling for a group, whether and, and I'm talking about a, a, a secular group here, not you know outside the church. Uh, whether you're a psychologist, um, a psychiatrist or a medical doctor, you're going to receive your counseling instructions, if, if I can use that term, and those counseling instructions are going to be very much the same as a pastor or a church person would receive because the church has chosen to adopt those counseling techniques. All right? We, we, the church has adopted these counseling techniques, but people have this misconception that because it comes from a church that it must have a deeper spiritual background, and it doesn't. I've talked to several pastors, I know several pastors, and all of their counseling, even though it may have been uh, uh, taught to them in a seminary type study or a uh, continuing education type study for the church the background for all of those still comes from the same resources as the people who are getting background and counsel, uh, counseling training from the secular sources now if that sounds confusing let me make this easy for you pastors are being taught the same thing when they go to school as everybody else there's nothing in their training that 
in, would indicate um, any different type of um, and a, a way to help people, okay? Now, I've spoken about this before. So let me, let me kind of put you in a place here. Um, because the church has really failed to get a genuine understanding of how unholy spirits affect people today, Okay, let me say that again. The church does not have a genuine understanding of how unholy spirits affect people. Um, I've talked about this at length. I'm going to again uh, in, when, when I do the, the next podcast next week. But for today, I want to stick basically with, with what we're going with. You know, we hear from the church folks all the time, well, all you need is Jesus. You know, that we hear that. We hear, oh, you just need to follow the Holy Spirit. Well-meaning, well-intentioned, yes. They really don't understand what they're saying. You know, what they're saying is when they say you need Jesus, they don't realize that what they're actually saying, Jesus' Hebrew name, uh, Yeshua, short form of Yehoshua, which means God is our salvation, what they're really saying is, You need salvation from our Creator. That's what they're saying, okay? They don't realize that's what they're saying, but that's really what they're saying. We also hear you need to follow the Holy Spirit. What they're not explaining is it's equally possible to follow an unholy spirit. See, you can follow those unholy spirits of addiction, depression, sorrow, okay? You can can choose to follow those, or you can choose to let them lead somebody else while you follow the Holy Spirit which is going to present itself as not only the love, peace, joy, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, those things but here we go. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? You have complete control and authority over which spirit you follow. You don't have to to follow an unholy spirit. Another thing that the church has forgotten is the definite the biblical definition of sin. You know, the biblical definition of sin is failing to follow the instructions we get from our Creator. We read that in First John chapter three, verse four. I hope you will take a moment. Pause this and go look at your Bible and see that 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, depending on your translation, is going to give you some indication that sin is either a transgression of the law, a violation of the law, a violation of the Torah. However you want to put it, that's what sin is. Now that's in the New Testament for all you New Testament Christians out there. Yes, I said that sarcastically because this is too important to overlook. You want to you want to help folks, you want to get people right. Here's what you need to do. You need to go back and teach the gospel that was once delivered to the saints. Not that Jesus died and was resurrected. What did he teach? He never taught his own death, burial and resurrection. Jesus taught repent for the kingdom of heaven is he often said it is at hand but he said repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of god is and and he also told us we can't grasp it right now flesh and blood can't grab hold of it. it's kind of like grabbing air it's always just at the edge of your fingertips no matter how far you reach it's just out of there and you say well why should i try because if you're trying you're searching, you're looking, you're, you're making an effort. If you're trying to, to grab the kingdom of heaven, trust me, you're not following an unholy spirit. Okay? It's impossible to follow an unholy spirit and attempt to grasp the kingdom of heaven. If we truly have a desire to end this suicide epidemic or this overdose epidemic, as people want to call it, we have to understand 
that it is the unholy spirits that lead people to choose death. It is the unholy spirits that choose people to 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 choose that lead people to choose death. I'm sorry if that was confusing. We've got to grasp that. We have to understand that. We have to be the ones who are willing to say, are you ready for this? If you can choose the Holy Spirit, it is entirely possible to choose an unholy spirit. You have complete freedom over which one you want. All right? Churches can and should take the lead on this to bring people together instead of driving them apart. And, and I'm going to be very critical of the churches right now. All right? You've got you've got to stop simply trying to fill pews with warm bodies. And you've got to stop thinking that the interdenominational contest that all of you are a part of is going to get your church leaders into heaven. They've got to return to the foundation of their faith and that is the importance of following the Creator's instructions. Plain and simple, folks. If you're not following your Creator's instructions, you're going the wrong way. From Eve through Moses, right down to each and every one of us alive today. We're given His instructions. We're told that to follow them. And if we follow them, we're going to have abundant life. Remember Deuteronomy 30, 19. It says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. Blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life that both you and your offspring may live. Now that, when Mo- well, when that was written just before the Israelites and that mixed multitude went into the promised land, let me say something. That was a long time ago. And it said you need to choose life not just for yourself but for those who come after you. <clears throat> How about John 10.10? He 10? should have said the thief doesn't come unless he's going to steal. He's going to kill. He's going to destroy. Salvation comes that you might live and have abundant life. A life of Filled with the blessings that the Almighty wants to give to you. Now I'm going to go into that a little more in depth next time. But for right now, I want to ask you. If you're hearing this, okay? If you're hearing this, you have probably an internet connection. Unless someone has downloaded it and they want you to hear what I'm saying. It's possible to turn your life around. If you're one of those who are hurting, depressed, think you're helpless, think that life is just miserable, you know what? You're not alone. Everybody, and I mean everybody, no matter how rich they are, no matter how poor they are, it doesn't matter how good looking they are, It doesn't matter how healthy they are. Everybody has hurts, habits, and hang-ups that they need to change. Everybody. There is not one person who has ever lived who doesn't need to receive what their Creator chooses to give them. And that is life. You have the ability and the authority to choose life. You can speak life. You don't have to speak death. You are the only you that there ever was. Of all the billions of people who lived before us on this earth, of everybody who's alive now, and of everyone who ever will be, you're the only you there is. You are you, and you have something to offer the people around you. Let me say that again. You are you, and you have something to offer the people around you. You don't have to think that life is so miserable, so so downplayed, that you should choose death. That is no way. That is absolutely no way to consider life. Let me ask you this. As I go through this series, and I'm going to do these on Monday afternoons, Monday evenings, depending on where you live, 
if there's something that you are so discouraged about, so despaired about, is it so important that you take your life today? Is it so important that you end everything tomorrow? Can it wait? Or do you think it might be able to get better? If you have an internet connection, if the person who shared this with you happens to have an internet connection, go to givegodnani.com. There is a plan there laid out. And it's not goal-oriented. You know, I don't promise you're going to be rich in 90 days. I don't promise you're going to be clean from an addiction in 10 days. I don't promise that you're going to turn things around tomorrow. Could happen? Absolutely. The only thing it promises is that your life will improve. It doesn't matter how... how it doesn't matter if you're one of those... Uh, who recognize your hurts, habits, and hang-ups, or if you think everything is just coming up roses. If you start following the Give God 90 plan, it will improve your life. You can't help it. Because what it does is it very slowly turns you around. It causes you uh, to follow that path of repentance. You didn't. Chances are you didn't get where you are overnight. It took you a while to get to the point where you recognize what you need, that you need something. This works you out of it. It gives you the opportunity to take control and do some things to turn yourself around. I had one person tell me that they thought they had it all together until they started doing this. And then they realized how far down they had gotten themselves. <clears throat> had another person tell me, um, <laughs> and I have to be careful how I say this, but they said, you know, I was happy. I was content where I was. And I thought, well, this can't hurt. I'm going to try it. And they said, now I realize what it is to wake up in the morning looking forward to the day, looking forward to going to work instead of dreading it. That's an improvement, folks. That's just an improvement. If you're one of these folks that need help, maybe you're somebody you've gotten, uh, maybe it's just a diagnosis from the doctor has got you a little down. Maybe uh, you might be somebody who is going through some financial difficulty. I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have the opportunity to take control of your life. This will help you. You can't help but improve your life and in turn improve the lives of the people you're close to. And all it is is some simple ways and some easy suggestions, easy, easy changes to make that get you back in the path of following your creator's instructions. Folks, I am going to, next time, really dig into these unholy spirits again and why people choose to follow them. We're going we're gonna to have this discussion because it's so important today. Until then, I want you to really grasp this question and wrestle with it. Should we treat overdoses you know we call them accidental overdoses sometimes but shouldn't we treat them for exactly what they are shouldn't we treat them as attempted suicide and really understand why these people want to do that why they're choosing death what are they following that has them so discouraged what are, they, what are they allowing themselves to feel when they go down that path? We've got to get a grasp on this. The church should take the lead on this. But folks, I hope you pass this along to your pastors because, yes, I am critical of churches, but it's not too late yet. They can learn how to do this. It's not rocket science. It's, it's scripture. It's all laid out in the Bible how we deal with this. And like I said, if you're one of those folks who are hurting, maybe you're, you're thinking about 
something you probably will regret later. It's not that drastic. You know what? Try give God ninety. If you still want to, if you still want to do what you're thinking about doing, after you get through, you know what? Maybe you should call me before you do. But we'll have that conversation then. Till then, till next time. I hope you have an abundantly blessed week, and I really hope you choose life.